This is the Nikon 180-600 f5.6-6.3 and no, this isn't deja vu, this is the second video about this lens. But this is my six month review of the lens because I like a long term review, although for lenses nothing really changes. I feel like you can get a good idea of a lens in a short space of time because they're less complicated than a camera for example. I mean they're more complicated in many ways, the optics obviously, but they perform fairly consistently in most situations and if you do your tests right you can get a good idea of it quite quickly. So I'm not going to retread all the ground of my previous video, if you haven't seen it go and check it out, it's quite long. It goes into what I was looking for from this lens and I put that out two weeks after I got it, mostly to exploit the YouTube popularity of the lens at the time. But it's six months later, has anything changed? Well, no, not really. But there is one thing I've tried different and that does cause some problems with this lens, so I'll go into that in a minute. But the general sort of summary of what I was looking for from this lens is for it to replace my Sigma 150-600 to Sport for F-mount that I was adapting to the Z-mount. And in what I was looking for from the lens, it's performed very well. I wanted something that largely did the same things, but was lighter for a start, and it is lighter, certainly wins in that regard. And it's a little bit faster to focus, it's a little bit sharper across the frame, has a significantly worse tripod foot, that's still bollocks, not going to change my opinion on that. And there was actually an issue I was having with the adapted Sigma, which I didn't mention in the video, because I still don't really know what was going on, where the camera was sort of locking up occasionally. I think it was a lens communication issue, and I've certainly had that a lot less with this lens, but I have had it once, and that's a little bit weird. So I've not managed to film it happening yet, but I have had the Z9 lock up a few times when shooting with both lenses. It's just less with this one. So in all those regards, great. I still like using the lens. It performs well. I would maybe say that I prefer the the color rendering of the Sigma, like photos that I took with it. I kind of preferred how they looked out of the camera. Maybe that's down to lighting at the time. I don't know. I haven't really performed exact scientific tests to compare the two. Just my opinion. But it's a good lens and the weight savings are worth it. Just in their own regard, really. They are huge. It's something like 800 to 900 grams lighter. It's a huge improvement. So that's nice. But something I did raise in my first video was chromatic aberrations, or blue fringing as I called it at the time. And it is chromatic aberration. There are also yellow fringes on the photos. So these only really occur in high contrast situations. And that is something that I bump into quite a lot because I'm photographing birds against ideally like a green background. I like them to look like they're not just in the sky. And in those sorts of situations, you're getting quite bright feathers or quite dark feathers against a contrasting background. And with a bird, I'm typically focusing on the head. And so things like the wings will be in different focal planes and they will show chromatic aberration sometimes. This isn't unique to this lens. The Sigma does it too, but it does it with different colors. It does it much less in my opinion. I think there's fewer situations in which I found it to be doing this. Whereas with this lens, I've noticed it a bit more. But is it an issue? Well, yes and no, because most software can correct for it automatically. But there is a downside, and that is that we're relying on software corrections to correct for flaws in a lens. And that means that there are certain situations where it's going to affect the quality of your image. And I tend to prefer sharper, better, cleaner optics than trying to fix it in software later. But this is sort of where the photography industry has been going lately, is leaning more towards software tricks to fix uh, flaws in the lenses that they sort of compromised on in the design of the lens just to make it more compact or bring some benefits to mirrorless. So I understand the trade-offs, but I do prefer an optically brilliant lens with some other disadvantages as compared to 
a very lightweight lens, for example, that then has to be massively overcorrected in the software, or the firmware on the camera, as many of them do. But there's another situation in which this is a problem, and that is if you like to use teleconverters. This is the 1.4 times teleconverter, and it's not very cheap. I think it's about 500 something pounds. They are quite expensive. It's a good quality teleconverter. You can use this with all of the Nikon primes and things as well. It performs very well, but there are downsides to using a teleconverter. Number one, it makes your maximum aperture smaller and therefore you get less light. That means your autofocus is slower and I can confirm that with this on that lens, the autofocus is quite notably slower, but it's still serviceable. You can still get birds in flight photos, for example. I've had plenty that have come out rather nice, but it exacerbates faults in the optics of a lens. And unfortunately, that means chromatic aberration. And if you use this with the 180-600, it's awful. The chromatic aberration that you get in certain scenarios is so bad, it is basically uncorrectable. And that's a problem because what you're doing when you're correcting chromatic aberration, or at least using the software way of correcting it, is it tends to shift things from one side to the other. So to correct the blue, it tends to sort of do a bit of a yellow fringe going the other way to offset it. All these sorts of weird things go on. And unfortunately, automatic profiles don't work correctly for this combination yet. I'm not quite sure why, but that's the case in both Lightroom and in Pure Raw. But even then, you can largely correct for this, especially on birds where it's largely on the outside of the bird. It's not too difficult to correct. But the bigger problem is more the yellow fringing, because when you correct that, you're going to lose yellows elsewhere in the bird. Now, blue is a fairly uncommon color in most birds, or at least it is here in the UK. Although, obviously, there are bluebirds all over the world. But yellow fringing is more of a problem because it will shift and affect the color of the beak and the legs on the vast majority of birds and you will get really weird colors. Now I don't like color shifting in my photos because it is, in my opinion, the hardest thing to fix later. It can be a real pain in the ass. It's why I got rid of the OM-1 because at high ISO where I shoot most of the time it was losing color data. Now when you use this combination together, it's the opposite problem. It's giving you more color data for colors that aren't there. And when you mix that with noise and with complicated feather details, for example, on this head of a red kite, it's kind of all over the place. Once you denoise this, it's even worse. And I've tried this in every bit of software. It's got blue all over its head very very strange there was no blue in this scene it was an overcast day there's no blue there like real blue obviously there's some shades of it mixed into things but this is all false color that has been added it's kind of like a really excessive moire really really weird and unfortunately none of the software can correct this automatically i have to manually change this so i mask it off and i uh, play with the color channels to remove that blue. And that is frustrating because it's poorer quality than it otherwise would be. But perhaps that's what you should expect when you use a teleconverter, but not really. And I've used these with every other long lens I've ever owned that it had almost no effect whatsoever on the Olympus 300 millimeter F4, but that is a prime lens. So perhaps that's to be expected. But for people on lower resolution cameras, Teleconverter is very useful because when you're shooting at high ISO already, it's better to have a bigger subject so that you have more detail so that you can maintain that detail when you denoise it. You don't want to have to be denoising something and cropping in and find that it's got no feather detail whatsoever. That is very frustrating. So teleconverters probably still have their place there and I do generally quite like they use, particularly at things like nature reserves where you're not really very close to the birds, it can be very useful. But if you're using a higher resolution body like the Z9 or the Z8, I would skip this combo and I will be skipping it in future. This is not a combination that works well, unfortunately.
because I have no doubt that this is a good quality teleconverter. There are plenty of lenses that it supports and I believe most of them will probably work quite a bit better than this. This isn't an S-line lens at the end of the day and perhaps that means that they've saved some money on the coatings, things like that, and this might be the trade-off that it just doesn't work quite as well. So that's my tip for people who have got this lens and who are, I guess, considering a teleconverter, but otherwise my opinion is largely the same as it was before. It's a good lens, it's a reasonable price, and I am largely quite happy with it still, but it's still not as nice as, for example, that Olympus 300mm f4, and that is the trade-off that you make for something that is quite convenient, I suppose, to have the zoom range. But what are your thoughts? Is this something that you've tried yourself? Is this something that you've run into? Uh, or is it something you've run into more with other lenses? I'd be really interested to know because there's a lot of other combinations out there on the market at the moment, or similar lenses like the Sony 200 to 600. Does that have the same issue? I'd be really interested in finding out, so please do put it down in the comments below. Thank you very much for watching, and I will see you next time. But for the first time ever on a video of mine, and I have quite literally never said it, please do subscribe to this channel if you don't already. I don't like saying this, I don't like leaning into a lot of the tropes of YouTube, but they exist for a reason, and that reason is that YouTube doesn't show quite a few of my videos to people who watch my videos regularly because they don't subscribe. The problem with how YouTube works is that it relies on a video already gaining popularity before it shows it to the wider audience of people who have viewed your videos before but don't subscribe. That is annoying and it's kind of a broken system, but if you do subscribe, it helps me out just because it allows me to expand this channel a little bit more and to spend more time on it. The more successful it is, the more justification I have for spending my time staring at a camera in my room. See you next time.